Oakwood Fruit Farm starting over after 100 years. So um, in uh, a little bit of history here, and you guys kind of here before, 1904, uh, my uh, great-grandfather started it as a nursery, then my grandfather came in. Um, 1955, my father come, uh, came back from school, uh, starts the dairy just for another stream of income, you know. If we get hailed, we get frosted, we've got the dairy there chugging along. Uh, at this point, if everybody knows dairy and making no money at all, um, but it kind of gave us, a, you know, a second thing. Um, it, it was just insurance. 93, I returned back. 2010, October 10th, so 10, 10, 10, it's easy for us to remember, we had a fire. So it gave us a very unique position that when we sat back and you said, oh, every day you're walking around, geez, I wish we had this. Geez, I wish it was that way. Because when you're there as long as we have, we'd built on here, we'd built on there. And we're, like I say, hilly. So any place that was flat, we'd built a building or built an addition onto this. And it was very cut up and it was very inefficient. Um, so we got to start over. Uh, it was a very hectic way of doing it because we had to be ready to go by the next year. Um, so the old building, um, it sat like this. The pack house was in the middle. It had two coolers in the back. Um, packing line was in the middle here. Our retail store was cut up, added, uh, you know, three spaces here. Had a bakery here. Um, it was very inefficient because the apples come in from the orchard, they go in the cooler, they come back to the pack house, and then they're going back, go back in the cooler, coming back out of the cooler to come back into the loading dock. So we were crossing paths a lot, um, running into each other. Um, it, it just uh, wasn't great. The building was in great shape, um, you know, very functional, everything. Um, it's just uh, a lot of wood, it's hard to clean. Um, you know, uh, flow wasn't great. Um, the only bright spot was is we'd never had a bakery and we added a bakery six weeks before that in the summer and I'll never forget because we don't um, point fingers at anybody in our family but somebody in our family said why have a bakery who in the heck's gonna drive out here to buy apple cider donuts and so we put one in it was in just long enough to see what it could do um, the old pack house was uh, old FMC weight sizer so it had these cups the apples rolled in the cups they rode over, there's a peg, when it gets to a spring, it had to sort from the heaviest to lightest. So when it got to a spring and it was heavy enough to trip it, it tripped and it fell out. So it, it, could, it would just sort by size. And you know how it is when you pick apples, you usually get a one size, it's kind of your common peak size. And so we had tables we would pack off of, like this, the apples would fall in here and then they'd pack into boxes. Well, inevitably, we had six drops, but there was always one or two that it was, more were coming there and so we'd have to stop and let people catch up go over there and help them and then go and then run again because you just couldn't you couldn't um, uh, separate them out anywhere lots of gray area all done by hand there was lots of these questions you'd go by hey should this be in should this be in should this go out is this a one is this a two um, when you're packing commercial um, it's it's a very hard line you know you they a lot of times what you put in at your retail store and you can and explain to your customers it doesn't matter they just got a person that's paid a lot of money that stands at the loading dock if this doesn't meet our specs you get to get it back so the fire, 10, 10, 10, um, this is what it looked like that night. Uh, next day, um, that's what the cooler looked like. We'd got done, this was on a Sunday. Friday afternoon, we got done picking. And I'll never forget, it was, it was full as one of our best crops ever. And we said, just stick it in the aisles. We'll have a big weekend this weekend. We'll get done, and we'll, we'll move everything back around on Monday morning, but just get it in the coolers. Um, so we were, we were stacked six high picking big 20 bushel bands and you know this is this is what it looked like um, the, the next day by the next Saturday this is what it looked like so we're all cleaned up pushed out and then we're trying to decide what we're gonna do um, you know we had to decide you know are we still gonna pack apples because most people would tell you uh, you know 180 acres um, about a hundred thousand bushel apples um, we sell about 10 to 20 percent through our retail the rest is wholesale you know that's not big enough you know, to put the expense in, to do a new packing line and do that. Well, we went together with a group out of Minnesota and we pack together now, uh, it's worked wonderful. They do all the marketing, we pack, um, we're much more efficient. We don't pack for any orders, we pack for sales projections. So I can pack uh, the same thing all day long, sometimes two or three days in a row. Um, so December, uh, this is one thing, how many of you have ever gone around and toured other orchards in September? Who the heck does that, right? We're busy. Well, we got to in October, and we got to see a lot of things um, during the season. We're like, oh, hey, that's a good idea. 
you know. And so uh, my uh, brother and sister, or my sister and brother-in-law, went and started touring retail establishments, some of the better ones. And I jumped uh, in on and started going around the country looking at packing house, packing lines, getting good ideas. Um, by Thanksgiving, we'd made our decision. And we started building uh, in the middle of December, July it was done, and uh, we were open and grand opening on uh, um, Labor Day weekend. So this is when they started building. Here's what the building looks like now. Um, here's how the shed is, is laid out. Um, you can see the apples in the background there. So our new retail store is 50% bigger. You know everything, it's gotta be bigger, you know. It still isn't big enough. Um, nice one big open space. The other one we had walls in there and so you know, you're kind of looking around, you tell them, well it's, well go around this wall and then go to the back corner and that's where it is. It's big open space. All our displays are movable. We bought all our most of all our displays at grocery store auctions. Um, and we knew we didn't want to have metal shelves and things like that so we wanted to stay with that farm market look. Um, the lighting is much better. Um, and we have all these movable displays, um, they tip up, and we have a lady that is a family friend that retired, she was in retail her whole life. First year she was there, it drove me crazy. She moved everything every week, and why the heck are you doing that? Because you want them to look around, what they love they'll go find, and they might find something else while they're trying to find what they love. So she moves stuff around with these displays, and it's great. It's really upped our business, um, and, and it's, it's just been a super thing. Now I just say, let her do. Just leave her alone. Let her do what she's doing. Um, so we've got all these wooden displays set up and uh, lots of jams and jellies. We try and do a lot of um, local stuff, Wisconsin stuff, Midwest stuff, uh, you know, smaller family things. Um, we don't do a lot of, nothing against it, we, we don't like to do a lot of trinkets and stuff like that. Um, it's fine if that's your thing, but my grandfather always says, God dang it, we're an apple orchard. If they walk into the shed and they have to look for the apples, we're not doing it right. So we try and focus on the apples, um, and they're the biggest part of it. Um, but that being said, uh, the jams and jellies are a very nice additive. They're, you know, they're kind of around the side. Um, but, you know, if, if some of those other things you can add in, whatever you can sell and make money, I would do it. We just run out of space. So the bakery, tremendous addition. People come back more often for their baked goods and then they buy apples, twice the size of the old one. This past season, 18,000 dozen donuts in two and a half months. Um, so that went from nothing and we remind uh, the member and the family that said, who the heck's gonna drive out here and buy donuts? <laughs> We've had them stand in line 45 minutes getting donuts. It's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. I'd never do it, but they do and we're happy to sell them to them. It's an apple cider donut. It is. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that's, we only sell one kind of donut, apple cider donut. You can buy it a dozen or half dozen, or four or five dozen at a time. We're glad to load them up for you. <laughs> um, here's the new bakery. You know, when you get to do this and start from scratch, you can design it the way you want. It's, it's, it's very nice. Make sure if you're doing anything like that, you know, frying, you've got a hood. That's where a lot of people, they try and skimp and they don't have fire protection in the hood and your insurance will quickly remind you what you're doing wrong. Um, you know, so we make all these things. Um, I think we sell on average about 2,500 handmade caramel apples a week. Um, pies and turnovers and things like that. We have uh, four or five different varieties of caramel apples. We always joke that that's our, our uh, most profitable apple on the farm is a caramel apple, you know. Um, so, um, packing shed. The new one, uh, layout's much more efficient, flows a lot better. Uh, as little two-way traffic as possible. One, it's just, you know, if you're going from there to here to back there, um, and safety, you know, is a big thing. You know, we're driving forklifts and things like that around. Uh, no storing of packed and un unsorted products together. That's just a food safety thing. Um, I know we all do it. We used to do it a lot. We, we, we don't do this anymore. Once it's packed, it goes in its separate cooler. Um, uh, food safety, it's made of uh, things that are easy to clean, and they're easy to clean because that doesn't go hand in hand. You can have something that's a very easily cleanable surface. If you have a lot of nooks and crannies, it's still hard to clean. So we're very conscious of those two things that they, they go in, uh, inside with each other. Um, new pack and sheds 120 feet wide, 180 feet long. Why did we come up with that? Honest to God. We went and measured to the very far back end because we're on a hill. So there's about an 18-foot bank. We measured to the very back end of where we could start building and measured all the way out to the parking lot and laid the parking stalls out to where we needed traffic flow. We drove two stakes and we said that's how big the building's gonna be. Because we wanted it as absolutely as big as we could possibly get it. And we didn't have the luxury of 
bringing in a bunch of fill because some of these areas we're going to have to put 18, 20 feet of fill in. And, you know, we were going to start building in, in, you know, two or three weeks. So we kind of had to just go where we were. Uh, we did add some around the outside edge. We could get out clear to the footprint where we used to drive around before and had our loading docks. So that was where we were able to widen it out. Um, three coolers, one for packaged, um, one with a smart fresh room. How many people know what smart fresh is? So you, you can, um, it's, it's a product you can use to extend the storage life of the apples. It works tremendous. We don't have to have a CA room. If you have control of the atmosphere CA room, it's, it's at least a million dollars to put one of those in. And our season isn't long enough to get the payback. But Smart Fresh has really helped us in those. So we have a little room where you put it in there, put the apples in, it's airtight. Um, you put them in for 24 hours and then take them out. We can treat um, about 100 bends at a time in that Smart Fresh room. And we hope to add another cooler. We're starting to grow um, with Pizzazz, which is a Honeycrisp Cross, and a lot of these other newer varieties are Honeycrisp Cross. Um, we want to add another cooler just for handling Honeycrisp. Bringing them in, storing them at uh, like 55 degrees for about 10 days, and then bringing it down. Um, you know, right now we don't have that capability in our rooms. We co-mingle the varieties so much. But we're, we're going to build a room just to handle our Honeycrisp and then our Pizzazz. Um, refrigeration is all in a rack system, which is really nice because it's efficient. So when all the rooms are running hard, all the compressors are running, as it starts to cool down and you get one room full, then it can shut off and just run one or two compressors or whatever you need. But it also makes it real easy. You can throw another compressor on when we build this other room and expand it. Um, packing area is dehumidified, which is really nice. So the guy, you know, we got lucky. The refrigeration company told us we hang, hung dehumidifiers up in the packing area so when it's hot, humid days, um, it's not actually air conditioned, but it just takes the humidity out of the air. It makes a big difference, you know, if it's 75 degrees and no, low humidity versus if it's 75 degrees and those hot, sticky days. Um, and the other thing is it helps get the apples dry. So when we're running them through, I'll show you on some of these processes. Um, it, it's a real bugger when the apples aren't dry. So here's the new one. Retail all on the end. The bakery's on this side. Um, the finished coolers here. So the apples come out of the two coolers. They go into the packing line. They get done. They go right out here. They go right into the uh, finished cooler. They go right out the other side in the loading area and right out into the dock. So we're not crossing paths. We're not going back and forth. Um, it's real easy uh, to, uh, to set things up here. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's real easy for, to tell people where to go. And you don't have to tell them when it's a finished product. Well, make sure we put it in this cooler because everybody knows. It goes in that one cooler. And actually, on this end is all for our retail stuff. We have display cases right there. So um, our caramel apples, um, uh, cider and all that, there we've got glass doors. They walk right up to and open them, and it's right into our cooler. So we can stock it all from back there. Um, we do not have a cider price we used to, but we went in conjunction with another larger grower that a few years ago they put in a press, had a big hailstorm, and they said, hey, if we put in a big press, would you guys be interested in having us custom press your cider? And ours was getting aged, and we said, yeah, if we're going to do something, we're going to do it good. So we take ours over there, they press it for us, and then they pasteurize and bottle it and bring it back for us. So, and it works, works really nice because he's big. We, you know, the commercial cider is, is very tough, and it's nickel and diamond. We, we, so we just do enough for it at our store. And so he sells a lot of commercial stuff, so we might take a semi-load of apples over to him, and we might only need half of that for us, Then he just buys the rest for his own. So it works out really good. Um, two coolers. One, one is a, um, a little bigger than the other. One is half the size of the other one. The reason we have that is um, so we can start up the small cooler at the beginning, and we're not running the great big one. And then as we get that full and we get into the heart of the season when we're bringing in a lot of apples, then we start the bigger one up. Uh, we stack eight high. We can hold about 60,000 bushel. And like I said, we have a smart fresh room. So the packing shed. Um, this is kind of the view from the front of the shed with all the machinery. Um, one of the things was is, um, when the, um, the company that designed this building, they had a fabric ceiling in. And I said, well, I don't want a fabric ceiling. I'm just thinking, how hard is that going to be to clean? Well, it's kind of a smooth plastic fabric. And when I toured a place in Michigan, I walked in, and the machine's running. It's all metal. And it was just loud as can be. And I literally, the guy was giving me the tour, and I said, just a second. I stepped outside the door and got on my cell phone. I said, put the fabric back in. And it's amazing how quiet this is. The first year, it drove me nuts. I'd be back out doing something in the loading dock, and I'd come around the corner, and I'm like, why is the line shut off? What's wrong? And it wasn't. It's just because it's so much quieter. So this, is, this has been great um, j just for our workers. You know, it's just so much. Um, you know, they can, they can talk a normal conversation in there, and they're not yelling. So it, it's a lot nicer, and it's not harder to clean. Um, yeah, this is great. I'm glad we added it. 
um, mezzanine, so we put this raised area in. So when all our apples get done and packed, they're on these rollers, and then we palletize them behind there, then we go right out into that door in the cooler. So above that, we have that mezzanine, so we make all our boxes up. The, all the pallets of boxes are up there, and then they're making them up, folding them up, and they slide them right down, right where we need them. So we don't have to run around and find them. Gave us all that extra space. Otherwise, we'd be trying to do it down here someplace. And there's not a lot of traffic going back and forth there, so we don't worry about it. It's a lot cleaner and neater. We don't worry about, you know, getting traffic going up and through there and, and getting something that could get on the boxes. But it's just, it just helped us a lot. I'm, I'm really glad we did this um, just for efficiency. I have seen this in big pack houses where they put a monorail around. And so they put a rail that's got hooks on it and travels around the packing house, and they... They hang the boxes on that, and then the people that are, are working and packing, when they finish one box, then they stand there, and then they just wait for the monorail to bring them the box that they want, and then they put it down. We're not quite big enough to do that, so uh, we went this simple way. Um, so how many people are, are familiar with how um, apples are packed commercially? Okay, so when you do it, like citrus and things like that, they can just dump them. You can't dump apples because it will bruise them. So the apples are picked in big bends, like this, 20 bushel bends. They're sat on those power rollers, and they, they slide across there, and then they get clamped down and lowered into water. And then the water, they float out into what we call the Lazy River. So this is just a, an L shape. It's full of water. And they float around that, and there's a, um, a flow of water. The water is pumped down here and pumped back up there, and that's what pushes the apples around to come out. And then as they work around there, you see them floating, it, floating in there, and they come up. And this is actually, they're, they're getting rinsed, and then they're getting sanitized here. So we use Sanidate, which is an organic product. Um, but it, you know, it, it'll, it'll kill anything that's there. So if we have any, don't have to worry about salmonella, E. coli, any of that. That's being taken care of there. And that's actually in the float water, in the, in the float water too. It's in there at just a little bit lower level. So we're actually doing it twice. And then they come up, these rollers are going around. And so they float up on that rollers and then the rollers just pick them up out, bring them up. Um, okay, so here, these are heat exchangers. So technically, if you're putting apples into water, that water must be maintained at at least 10 degrees above the temperature of the apple. And the reason for that is if that apple, it gets colder, the water's colder than the apple, that water can be pulled back in through the calyx end of the apple and can potentially contaminate that apple. So this heat exchanger, all our, our hot gas from our coolers, which we're producing all that hot gas every day, that hot gas gets piped down through here. The water from the, uh, the float tank is circulated through here and we get it heated for free. So that's set on a thermostat, 90 degrees um, is as high as it'll go. If it gets the water to 90 degrees, then it just goes out and it would go out like a normal system and just get, um, go outside and get, get it uh, cooled outside. But this has been great. Um, just because of the, the food safety thing. The other thing, too, is it makes the apples dry down easier. They're not sweating, you know. They're in this tank on average uh, six to eight minutes, depending on how fast we pack. Our old system was four lanes, and we could pack about 700 bushel a day with about 18 people. Uh, this new one is one lane. Uh, we can pack about uh, anywhere between 15 and 1,800 bushel apples a day with about 22 people. Um, it's just because things are faster. Uh, it's just constant circulation. We're not renewing the water all the time, and so it's filtered and it's treated with this chemical. So it's because um, there's about 2,500 gallons in there, and uh, I don't know of any place where they're constantly changing that water all the time. As needed, we'll we'll drain that and clean it and, and change it. But the the one so if you look here, that water there where it's spraying them and doing the rinse, that is new water. Yep. The other float tank is recirculated water. Um, and you'll see later where we're monitoring that and how we're doing that. Um, so these heat exchangers have been great. We get that done for free. Do you have to, do you have to monitor the concentration of your standard? Yep, you'll see. I'll show that later how we're doing that. Um, then the packing line, you'll see where they're coming up out of there and they go into there. And those are big fans, and that's just to dry the apples off, dry the water off them. And then next one is this. This is the brush bed. So when they're going down through here, those apples are coming across, and those brushes are just polishing the apples. They just shine them up. And then they go on through, and once they get through that, that's just a big drying tunnel. Um, unfortunately, since we go, have most of our stuff goes commercial, one of the requirements is they have to be waxed. And so they're, they're waxed at the end there, and they go through that drying tunnel, and that drying tunnel, all it's doing is drying the wax. If we could not wax apples, that'd be the greatest thing ever. Let's start a petition. But um, they make us do it, so that wax gets everywhere. Um, then they come around the end. There's kind of a big horseshoe. They come around the end. There's people up here that are doing the first inspection, looking for cuts or anything like that. 
We try not to pick any rotten apples. We tell the pickers not to. Um, so they're going through and leaves. This is one of the biggest things. They get leaves off because when you'll see in the next step when I tell you when they go through the computer system, they see that leaf is a big spot on the apple. So they're picking leaves. That's mostly what they're doing. And then you see as it comes down through here, here's the, the computer up here uh, where they're going through. But then these are just the outlets where it's dropping the apples. Um, so uh, in the old line, you know, we did it by hand. In this one now, the, the machine is putting them in the trays. So the trays come out underneath. The apples come right out and go right into the trays and the size. Or in their bags, or we do a lot of tote bags. Tote bags we have to do by hand yet. We haven't found a way. But we're dropping the right amount of apples and the right apples in the openings. So the old one, we had six drops. This one, I believe, nice thing about this, too, uh, the workers do the final inspection, but 90% of the work is done for them. Color is done. They don't have to worry about color at all. The computer is 100% accurate on the color. They don't have to worry about is if I said they need to be 50%, you know, what's 50%, you know? Is it 50%? Is that spread out over the whole apple or 50% in one area? Um, and it's the same on Monday morning as this Friday afternoon. So that, this has been great. Um, so we looked at, um, um, at three different companies for the pack and line, uh, toured a bunch of different places, decided on Compaq because we liked what, how their software was. Um, we could do what we want to do with a one lane versus a two lane or a three lane. And every time you add a lane, that's more computers, that's more things to go wrong, that's more expense. Um, we've been very happy with it, a very steep learning curve. Boy, I found out in a hurry, I don't know much about this stuff. Um, has two computers, one runs the vision part, so as they go through, <coughs> it's taking pictures of the apples, puts it together, makes a 3D model. So one computer's doing that and saying, okay, the apple is, is uh, you know, this is the dimensions of the apple, um, this is the, how much color it is, it's got 42% red, uh, it's got a mark here, it's got a blemish there, um, and deciding what grade it is, if it's a one, two, uh, or a, a juice apple, and the other one runs the sizes. So once it's determined where that apple goes, the second computer decides where it's going to drop it. Um, so if it's, if it's a smaller apple going into the bags, if a big apple going into trays, um, or if it's, uh, you know, a color, um, we, we might be packing two different grades of colors for two different customers um, that day. Um, like I said, does weight, color, size, defects, and we have IR, uh, infrared on ours. And so when we look at it, we're looking at it in color and infrared. Infrared is great at finding cuts and holes, stem pokes and Honeycrisp, things like that. Because in color, you know, if, if you're just looking at sorting by color, um, color might be the same, you know, um, might be good on one thing and bad on another. You know how that is? You look at it and there might be uh, something where, um, you know, like say scald or something like that. You know, you get just started in that scald and that might look really close to what orange is. In the human eye, it looks okay. But on this thing, it's just working on a scale. Um, so the infrared, like if you get holes where there's, where there's a change in depth, you can't see that in color, that's where infrared finds that real easy. It's also great because it's got to identify the stem and the calyx. Because it sees every apple has two defects, right? It's going to see two holes, the stem and the calyx. Well, it's great at finding those, and it knows, hey, those line up opposite each other. That's the stem and the calyx, and we won't worry about those. Um, cameras overhead and on the side. The, it, the apple sits on these carriers, and as they're going through there, they're rotating. So it spins that apple one revolution as it goes through there, takes pictures of them, takes between 40 and 60 pictures of each apple. It's smart enough to shut off and stop taking pictures and start on the next apple when it, when it sees a stem and calyx come around. Uh, puts those together, makes a 3D model. Um, you teach it the colors and the defects you want. So here's what it looks like when I look at the screen. So here's that apple as it's rolled through there. And so the, this is, uh, that's the top, uh, that's the side view, this is top view, and this is the other side. Puts them all together and makes that 3D model. And it does it in about this much space. And those apples typically are running through there uh, about 620 apples a minute. Uh, and so it's got to do all that, put that together, get the weight, get the, where it's going to drop it, because when it gets about another three feet away, the, that's the first drop. And so it's got to have all decided um, by then. Now we have 28 outlets. Uh, we pack by weight, by number, or both. So we could say we want that three-pound bag to weigh 3.1 pounds, but also we want 17 apples in there. Um, so then what it'll do is it'll, it'll start filling that bag, and when it gets close, it'll stop filling that bag, start filling another bag, and start looking for the exact right apples to put it on there, so we're doing 3.1 pounds. On our old one, it was just by weight. So if you're at 2.99 pounds, it just rolled the next apple. And if it was a bigger apple, we just gave away a quarter of a pound of apples. Well, you do that you know, all day long, a 1,000 boxes, you gave away a lot of money. So that's where this uh, is, is a lot nicer. And also, um, we can do it, it has an optimizer. And so if we're packing, like, say, 88 count uh, for today, and that's the big one we need, 
Um, and we say optimize 88s. Well, there's always a, a line, a cut line. So below um, 88s uh, would be 100 count. Everybody know how that works? So 100 count, 88 count, that's the number of apples in the box. And the, the higher the number, so 100, that means there's 100 apples to fill that box. 80 count, there's 80, so that means they're bigger apples. It took less to fill them. And that's your standard uh, grades. And so if we say we want a whole bunch of 88s, there's always a, you know, you go from, uh, you know, this size, you know, from the, the bottom of the 88 to the top of the 80, you know, there's that variance. And so where you make that cut, um, you could stand there and manually push that back and forth, but this machine will automatically keep pushing that back and forth as much as it can to optimize that, but keep your end weight on target because you don't want to come up and have your, your end weight being off. So it does that all day long. Um, the envision part, so that's the part where it's took, taking the pictures and looking at the apples and deciding what they are. You set up, there's nothing preset. Boy, I was shocked at this. I thought I'd get a program, they'd drop it off. Here's my Mac program, turn it around, start running Macintosh. Nope, you teach it everything. You have to put an apple in there, take the pictures, show it the colors, what's red, what's blush, what's green, and what the, all the differences, and then, I, then you set up your... Um, your, your grades, so can it be 50%, can it be 30% red, different customers, and I change that throughout the course of the day or through the course of the customer, you know, if they have a higher demand for higher things, sometimes we're packing two different grades for the day. Um, typically no, and the reason we don't have is because our, the, the criteria for the, com the, for the commercial, the wholesaling is much higher, and I don't like them to say, okay, we're packing for our store today, we can go a little less. I like them to stay on that, that higher end because then they, they're always grading consistently the same if they're taking something out. We do sell a lot of seconds. So our seconds are better than juice and not as good as ones. And our seconds typically sell for more than what we can get for the number ones to the wholesale. Um, so that was one of the big reasons we put a packing line in. Um, because we didn't want to just go to somebody else and have them pack. And those seconds, we'd all lose. A lot of places call them table sorts. They're uh, better than the juice apple, but in most places, those all just go into juice apples. So we have those. So we're not super worried about losing them. Um, and typically, when I'm running for our store, um, as we're doing things, I'll try and pick out some of the better lots, you know, so if we got one. So we're running better stuff for the store anyways. Because as the course of the week when we're packing um, for the grocery stores, we're getting enough seconds in that out of them. So I try and do it because um, realistically our orders are, we're in, have such demand on the wholesale end that to, to pack for the store, which is a major part of our thing, it slows us down. And so I want to pack the best stuff I can for the store to get it done as quickly as I can. Because typically there we're doing all hand stuff. You know, like um, we do a lot of uh, peck and half peck bags where we're tying the tops because we've not found a better way of doing it. We don't like the bag, the tote bags, you know, because they tip over in the bend, they tip over in the displays and stuff like that. And so we're hand tying them, so we have to go much slower than in the automated stuff. So I try and as, as they're coming in in the cooler, we're sorting them out and saying, hey, this is the better ones. We're going to run them for the store. Um, so you set everything up. You set your cut points. Um, you can um, uh, add internal defect, which is kind of like very simplified, like candle and an egg. It shines a light through there. Um, so that's really good on, on things like water core, um, internal browning on Honeycrisp. We don't have this yet, um, and we're talking with the other packing houses we work with on who's going to put this in because it'd be a specialized thing, and then we would just move lots of apples around. Um, you know, if somebody's got, oh, hey, we're seeing some internal browning, we could take it to whatever orchard uh, is going to put this in and, and run it there instead of all of us having the money in it. Sizer, um, you create your products. So an example of a product would be a five-pound bag, might be a peck bag or whatever, and that's just because you're setting your weights for your product usually or your number that's in there. Um, and then you create your elements, and elements is, is uh, something that's in a product. So like 125, we do all ours on the counts for the different size apples. And so your, your, your product will have different elements in it. And so typically the three-pound bags for the grocery stores are the smaller apples. I can go and pick what elements, so if I pick from two and a half up to 125 count, go into the bags, and then if I'm packing for the store, what size is going in, and you can just go in here and click. Click in here, click in and out what's, what I'm adding, what I'm subtracting, so if, if we're doing for the store and I'm trying to get a few more, I can add a, add a few more smaller sizes that day or something, if, I'm, if I know I'm not getting what I need or I can take them out. And that one that's lit up red means, hey, I don't, I don't have that element anywhere. If you start up now, it's just gonna send them off the end into the juice apples, so you gotta make sure, it, it warns us you don't leave one out. Michigan. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. So that you'd be shipping your stuff a long way away, right? To get it so they'd have that next thing you could do the browning on the inside? Yes, absolutely. And the group we work with now, none of us have it, and we are sending them to Michigan if we have those lots to do that. Um, yeah, it's uh, about a seven and a half hour drive. Depends on how fast you drive, I guess, right? How far it is. Um, so, yeah, warns you if you leave it out. Um, decide what products are dropped where. So he, these are all the drops, and I can just click on there to, to say if I want my three pound bags or five pound bags, which ones are gonna drop them in. And then it's telling me what I have in there, and I can hover over it and see. And also, um, whoopsie, so if we go back, Way over here in the upper left-hand corner, that's telling me my up to the second um, what we're doing, my totals. So I know what sizes are peaking, and so I know a good, really good worker can do handle about 18 to 20%. If I see a size or I see a product that's over 20%, I better be splitting it, or we're going to start piling up and getting behind. And when this thing, neat thing is, is I could, maybe I, maybe I don't have another place to split it, but what I could do is I could share an element in there. Uh, share a size in that with another one to bring that down three or four or five percent so that way that person can keep up. Um, okay, food safety. So um, this, this new facility is mostly metal and equipment is stainless, very easy to clean. Uh, we also bought a foamer um, so we, we can mix our sanitation products in the foamer and go around and foam things. That foam is great for round surfaces, because if you just put water on it, you know, it'll run around and it'll drip off and won't get around to the bottom sometimes. Um, cracks and crevices, that foam gets in there and sticks right to it, and it does a, does a great job. Brushes, you know, those brushes are notorious, you know, for, you know, how do you clean, just think about if you're gonna use a hairbrush to put honey on your bread, right? How do you clean that thing, right? <laughs> and so the foam does a great job on getting in there and cleaning those things. We also have a fogger. Um, I can put it in our coolers um, before we start up, make sure everything you know, is clean. Uh, I'll run it uh, lots of times in, our, um, in the pack house before we start the season. I'll also run it in our bakery before we start the bakery up at the beginning of the year just to make sure there's nothing. And ozone is a huge thing coming along in here, and that's what we're looking at putting in next, ozone, because ozone is great for um, sanitizing like with just straight water, um, but it's also great for sanitizing the air. So we're thinking about putting ozone in where we could sanitize, put it on a timer, sanitize the pack shed every night, or put it in our coolers because same thing, your stored apples in there, you know, if they're going to be in there long term, you could do that. It'd cut down on your molds and things like that. What do you put in the fogger for sanitizing? Uh, we're using, um, uh, we either use um, a amine Z, which is a, like a quad, or you can do it with a sanidate. But I found it easier with an amine Z uh, and that. It's just, it's just easier product to, to work with in there. Um, a lot of those foggers, they use them in dairy plants, they use them in hatcheries, places like that. Um, it's just a little thing, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, electronic monitoring system in the dump tank, uh, it keeps track of all our chemicals all day long. Um, hooked up to a dosatron, um, so it automatically dispenses. If it sees the chemical level has gotten below my set uh, point, it just automatically starts running and, and bringing it in, and when it brings it up, gets it back in that, that area it's supposed to be, it shuts it off. Um, and then I also hooked it up the, to that dose trying I hooked a hose up so I can walk around and sanitize with that and it's automatically dispensed at the proper levels. I don't have to keep going back and mixing it up and going out and I don't have to tell somebody, hey, you mix this. I just turn the dose trying on, turn the hose on, then walk around and sanitize um, our packing line and, and those type of things. Food safety, so now we've got a nice hand wash station right where you come in from the bathrooms. We also have uh, wash uh, um, sinks and that in the bathroom, but people in the pack house. So if they get you know, a cut or they get grease or something on their hand, they've got this nice foot operated. Uh, we've got an eye wash station and everything there, uh, first aid all put up. So here's the, the system I was telling you about. So this system, so this is our, our Sanidate, we buy that. Uh, and it dispenses right out of that. The pumps are right here. Here's the screen, so I set it where I want. I can walk by all day long, and I'm looking at the, 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 the level of the chemical in the tank and the level of the chemical in that spray bar that I showed you. They're two different levels. It keeps track of them there. It automatically dispenses them as we need it, but it also logs everything. So for my food safety records, I go back there, I can download that, and it'll show me that it's kept it, you know, during the running time, it's kept it where it needs to be. I can just download that. But we also do this by hand, too. I double check this every day, twice a day, with strips in the water just to make sure that everything is right, and then I record that also. And then I also record the water temperature, that it's, it's where it should be. 
Um, it just shows you here. It's got when that's on. There's two, there's that screen has two different bars on it, and it's showing the level. It's showing the exact level. It's just not showing you a bar in the area. It, it tells you it's. A, we run these. Um, in the float tank, it's at 40 to 60 parts per million. It'll tell you if it's 46 parts. And the spray bar, we run it at uh, 80 to 100 parts per million. Um, so conclusion, um, the new retail store has really uh, grown our business. And it, it's incredible to think we're in business for 100 years. And the, the two years after we opened our new retail, we increased by almost 30% sales. Um, and a lot of it was, you know, we got a lot of publicity, you know, the, the, about every news crew around came, and when, when the building burnt and it came and they told the story, and then we made sure we contacted them the next spring and said, hey, listen, now you can tell the good part about the story. We're back, we're going again in the next generation, you know, we're set to go. And so we had a lot of advertisement, and, and what we said was, okay, hey, we got a lot of new people going to come and see this place. We've got one shot to impress them and keep them coming back. If we don't, it's our fault. And so we, we kind of capitalized on a lot of that. The bakery has been a tremendous addition. Um, packing line is much more complicated, much more powerful. We're probably getting 70% out of it of what we could. Most places would, will have a full-time person just doing that. Um, I do that. I do the food safety. I load the trucks. Um, I do you know the calls to see what we're packing um, and, and on you know chemicals and all that stuff. So. I'm doing a lot of things. If I would just set my butt behind that thing, I could make us a lot of money um, But doing that. I just simply don't have the time to do it. They asked us when we put this in, um, the guy said, can you pass the bus test? I said, what the heck's the bus test? He says, if you get hit by a bus, can somebody else run it? And absolutely not. We still can't. And that's, that's a big problem for us. You know, I, I need to teach somebody else. If this happened, if, if I'm gone, they can't even turn this line on. So I, I need to get somebody trained to do this, to take over this. You know, a lot of the stuff, the day-to-day -day running of it, it's, it's, it's complicated, but it's not terrible. Setting up the programs, um, it would take quite a while to teach somebody else to do it, but um, it, uh, it, it could be done. Food safety is much higher and much easier, and that's a big thing. You know, uh, someone asked me before about FISMA coming along. Everybody know about FISMA, and the new, you know, first time we've had, you know, rules that uh, produce people have to follow before it was kind of voluntary you know um, we've had to follow them for a long time because our buyers have made them fo made us follow them so FISMA is not a as big a deal to us because we're doing a lot of those things um, but if you have questions on that I can tell you how we started and that's one thing I would tell you start ahead because it's a whole lot easier doing it in baby steps than going holy mackerels I got two months to get all this done you're gonna end up spending more money doing it hastily and probably making mistakes so start doing it ahead of time and a lot of that, a lot of this just boils back to record keeping and tracking. And one of the big things of those food safety and the most of the food safety things, you know, the last one with the romaine lettuce, what was the big problem? They couldn't track it down. They couldn't track it back. And that's what they're going to cut back. And so you need to have some kind of a, a lot or recall program and everybody thinks big and complicated. Buy a pricing gun. Buy a pricing gun, you can make your lot code on that. Your lot code can be anything you want, as long as it makes sense to you. So all you do is on your, it has to go on your end box, so if it's a tote bag. But if you're selling direct to the customer, that's a little bit different thing. But you can still do that coming out of the orchard, because that's the biggest thing. It has to track back from, from your shed back to the orchard where it was picked, so they can find it. You can do that all with, with, with stickers and with, with a, with a um, pricing gun. You know, so you can make your lot and just write your lot down. So some of these things are simple. But just give yourself some time to explore those avenues. Um, insurance. Uh, here, there, here's one. We really, uh, we had good insurance. But how many people sit down and review your insurance every year at the beginning, like say in the middle of August, when you know what your crop is this year? See, that was our problem. We had a big crop. We had a really nice crop of apples. Everything was full. If we would have had the fire two weeks earlier or two weeks later, we'd have been okay. Well, we were so full, our, our top coverages didn't cover us in the worst case scenario. We were completely full of apples, we were completely full in the retail store, and we were completely full with all our packaging, because we were in the heart of the season. So think about those things, because I think it cost us like $100 to add another couple hundred thousand dollars of insurance for peak season coverage, because their risk for a month isn't much. So you can easily add that in the middle of your season so we review it every year in the middle of august we sit down and say what's the crop look like um do we need to add more peak season coverage for that 
Um, and then just sit down every year and review stuff, you know. If you bought stuff, you know, add it on. Lots of times you're paying for stuff you don't even have anymore and you just forgot about it. But get in the habit of reviewing that. Um, the other thing is if you can travel around, take a day or something where you can travel and go to other places during the season. I know we have lots of meetings in that during the growing season, but if you're in your retail operation or your wholesale operation, seeing an operation run when it's in the peak of, of its capacity, that's when you learn a lot of things. Um, that's when you usually learn a lot of really good ideas that people don't necessarily want to show you and talk about, but when you get there and you're watching it run, you're like, that, that's, a, that's a really good idea. I never even thought about that. And then they kind of look. I was at a pack and shed one time. There was a great idea. They had on the side wall, they had uh, brooms and shovels and things like that, and they had the handles all painted. I'm like, what do you have that for? Well, those are food safety ones. So to go into the water tank, those only go in the water tank. They know if they have a blue painted handle, they are not to be used on the floor or anyplace else you know, sweep up grease and then let's stick it in the water tank. So that was a good idea. So we're all great. We whip out our phones. A guy come over right away. Nope, 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 no pictures, no pictures. Get out of here. You know, and so those are things sometimes if you're not in a group touring, you know, you, you can see some of those things where they maybe don't want to give their best ideas away. Um, future, we're looking to expand our season. You know, we've got that packing line, and that's what they said. We're not big enough to put a big packing line in and make it pay. We need to have our season start earlier and run longer. So that's why we're looking at some of these new varieties that we can push our season out um, on the ends. Um, but we've got to find these quality varieties for us to, to, to make it work. Um, you know, we're looking at probably on most of these things, we want to commit, um, you know, 10 to 20,000 bushels to it. And so we have to have something that's going to be commercially accepted. And, and our, our group, we sit down and we talk about what we're going to go into, you know, what varieties we're not. That's where I talk about Crimson Crisp. Every year I take Crimson Crisp there and try and sell it. Um, and every year they agree it's a great apple, but there's nobody behind it to push it. And so those are the things we have to, you know, have to decide what we can put in that uh, work into the marketing program of our whole group. This is where if you're just doing it yourself, um, you know, your start of the season, I think almost everybody wants to push their season uh, earlier. Um, it's just finding quality things that work there. Later, you know, if you're, if you are, uh, you know, you want to shut down at thank or at uh, Halloween or Thanksgiving or whatever, you know, you plan your varieties uh, accordingly. Um, may I pick your own? You know, we've we've done this for a while. We've been there. Um, a lot of our we've got fourth generation customers, and they're not trained to pick your own. They don't even think about. It. But we're getting new customers, and they ask about it. So we've talked about planning to pick your own. Quite frankly, our problem is parking. We don't have places to park them. You know, when people come to do agritainment or things like that, they spend a lot more time there. And, you know, our thing is we've got lots of people there to help people get things in their carts. Thanks for coming, put in your cart, and leave because we need that parking spot. You know, we don't tell them that, but that's the whole idea because we're out of parking. Um, and so if we go to pick your own, we know that's going to make an even bigger problems. So we've got to decide where we're going to go with the pick your own people to park. Um, for us, uh, no, because it doesn't work in our program. Now, if I had someone like Deidre came and said, hey, if you can grow 10,000 or 5,000 bushel of this and it's a good price, absolutely we would. Um, but it would have to be, because um, we had this conversation in Wisconsin a few years ago. We did, a, we did a big thing with Wisconsin apple growers and all that, and it kind of boils down to um, I'll grow anything I can if I make more money off it than the, something I'm removing. So that's where it's got to fit in, um, you know, and absolutely, if, if we could, if we had someone that came and said that we wanted to do that and, and, and we'll commit to it. But the problem with it is it's not like corn and beans, right? If you go out, if you commit and you say, if you grow me 10,000 bushel of this and you go in and eight years from now, you go out of business, now what do I do with them? If I'm planting corn or beans, next year I just plant something different. So that that's becomes where the, the problem to the, the size and the volume that we want to do, that's where the problem comes in. For us, because, you know, if we put in, we, we will put some things in for the store, um, a few things, and, you know, and we'll probably be talking, starting out there, you know, a um, couple hundred, two, three hundred bushel. But really, um, when we get picking and we get going, and uh, we're bringing in about 3,000 bushel a day, um, finding those, you know, not losing those things, you know, and you get a half a ben of this or whatever comes in, um, and you put it around, and so that, yeah, that gets a little harder for us. Um, uh, to, to do those things. We will try on some of those, and typically we try and, and you know, put them in the end of a place where we can find them, but it's still keeping track of them and, uh, and taking that space. We'd probably do that with an early season variety, you know, when our, when our store is, you know, we're running, and we have less. But when you get right into the middle of the season, we've got everything coming in. 
um, it, it'd be a lot harder to convince us of that. Um, like I said, looking at adding ozone sanitation, um, it, it, it's really neat. It, it's, it's more effective. Um, there are some limitations on it as I start checking into it. Um, and then add another cooler for preconditioning pizzazz and honeycrisp. That's, that's one of our next big things um, when we have that perfect year, you know, where everything comes in, huge crop, good prices and everything. We'd like to add this out. We've kind of got it all figured out. It'd be pretty easy to do, um, but that's the next thing. It's mostly for storage and scald and those type of things. Um, so if you bring them in and you, and you um, drop them down, Honeycrisp and almost all Honeycrisp um, related varieties are, are very cold temperature sensitive. So if we bring them in and crank them down to uh, 33, 34 right away, um, and, and it's, they're goofy because they won't do it every year, but some years they will scald like crazy. I don't know if you know what scald is, but it's a, that browning on the external surface of it. And you can look at it one day and it doesn't have it there. The next day, it'll be the size of a quarter. Two days later, you know, it'll be this, you know, half the apple. And it just keeps getting worse. Bitter pit, does that affect No, no, uh-uh. So bitter pit is, is more of a disorder that develops during the course of the year. And scald develops in storage. And so by preconditioning and bringing them in and bringing them in, hold them at 55 degrees for a week, or 10 days, and then bring the temperature down to about 40, um, that you remove a lot of that problems, and internal browning. Um, and so um, pizzazz and honeycrisp are both very susceptible to that, and we're starting to grow uh, quite a bit of both, so that's why we're thinking we want to have that room where we can do those things um, to condition them instead of putting them in our other cooler. Any other questions? Sure, um, 100% works the best, um, but you know we 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 look at um, you know varieties. Um, if and some of it has to do with you know what what crop you can hang on them. We all know you can't hang as big a crop on Honeycrisp as you can on like Gala or Pizzazz. So if I take um, you know 70% uh, pack out on Gala, uh, ver you know, now this is if they're the same price. So 70% pack out on a Gala. Um, versus 70% pack out on Honeycrisp, my production or my, my revenue per acre is less because I've got a smaller Honeycrisp crop. Um, but we like to see them, you know, as absolutely as high as we can. We start um, packing the new um, Macs, like Ruby Mac. Like if we're over about 80% on Macintosh, on our others, and we grow a lot of Macintosh, too many anymore. Well, we used to grow about 80% of it was Macintosh. If we're in at 80% or above, um, you know, we, we thought if we could consistently run that, we were pretty good, you know. And you lose a lot there to color and bruising. And these new ones, um, I can see that pack out. Right, every second, it's, it's running there, it's telling me what my grade out. On these new Ruby Max, which are almost totally red, we consistently run 95 to 98%. Um, and our galas, if we get them big enough, if we get them over that two and a half inch size to meet that minimum spec, we almost always run 95 to 98%. Now when we pack Honeycrisp, we're probably more like in that 70% consistently. And that's more so um, stem pokes, and we're looking at going to stem clipping everything. Um, just because that stem, as it sits in and uh, dries out, you know, those apples move around or, you know, you run them across the line, you put them in a bag, you set them out on your shelf or they go to a grocery store and they're rolling around, it keeps making holes. And so we're losing that there. But, you know, even if we don't lose it on our end, on the, on the other end, you know, the grocery store will say, hey, listen, I got a lot of stem pokes in here. Well, they're looking at them, they've been rolled around on the shelf for a, for a week. But... Um, so does that kind of answer your question? We like to be, you know, it's not realistic to think you're going to be 90% on everything. Now, we do have some lots of Honeycrisp that will run 90%. The newer, redder ones, younger trees obviously do better. Um, you can have some problems in younger trees on bitter pit, though. You know, the harder we're pushing these trees to grow, the more some of those issues. And that's where, if I double back to our last one, I don't think I really touched on, we, we don't put, we don't let, if the tree has not filled its spot, we don't crop it. Nothing, zero apples on it until it's filled its spot. Now, if we've got it this year, we're looking at it and we say it's, it's almost there, but I need to put a few more branches in the top of the tree, I might hang a half a crop on it. And the reason for that is, is, is that tree, we've probably pushed it hard last year. You know, and so we're typically running, um, you know, um, feeding that tree um, calcium nitrate uh, a couple of times, um, 
foliar feed net um, every time we go by that. Um, and then uh, we do a, use a product called uh, top wire, which we're putting on the ground. Um, so we're feeding these trees a lot, get them to push. I get a lot of growth on them. So if I did that last year, these are like an iceberg. Even if I cut it off this year, there's still a lot of, a lot of that in there, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of vigor, and we're still that tree just kind of keeps on, as I would say, oozing along. Well, that's, you're going to have poor quality fruit. So if it's something where you're going to get and you're going to move out right away, you're probably okay. But we still don't want to have our, our retail customers take that home, and if they leave that sit for three or four weeks, they're just not going to keep as well. So that's why we kind of take the hard and fast rule is if we're still growing that tree, we want everything to go to growing that tree. And then if we come out, you know, the, the other side, hopefully now we know we're getting close. We've shut that off this year and then next year. Um, but we'll still try and move those, the, like the first big production year on those trees, we'll still try and earmark that stuff and move it earlier as to let it sit longer. So, you know, you, if, if you try and have your cake and eat it too, it usually bites you twice, especially on Honeycrisp varieties. Yep. Anything else? And since we didn't have much time on the last one, if you got a question on that one. Um, I think for us, it's, you know, it's moving to this high density and um, the, uh, the pruning is so much easier. On the other way, man, we could get 10 of us that are all experts and go into a central leader tree and we would all have a different idea what needs to stay and what needs to be taken out. It's just so much simpler. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot nicer tree to deal with. Um, the varieties, I think it, it, we're coming into a, a, a part of our industry that we've never seen before. Um, before Honeycrisp came along, everybody had their favorite variety of apples, and when they came to your store, you tried to convince them to buy something else. You know, you're like a car salesman, well, you should try this, and they're all like, well, you know, I've got my favorite, I'm going to buy that. You're just trying to sell me something you want to get rid of. Well, when Honeycrisp came along, people tried a new apple, and the mindset now is they want to try new things, and, and it's great because at your retail store, people are willing to do that, and they want to talk, and they want to be educated. Um, we were just talking about it before, the story, you know, so they, you've got that opportunity to, to tell them everything, tell them that story, the history behind that apple and where it came. So that's really interesting because we've never had that before. I can't ever remember a time where we had so many new varieties coming along. Um, and on the retail side, I think it's great. Try all the ones you think you can, talk to other people, see what fits in for you, uh, try a few. On the wholesale end, I can't do that because, you know, we've got to have something that we're going to roll out in a program and, um, you know, so we want the production. So we kind of get in that 2,000 to 10,000 bushel, we're in no man land in there. And so it really sucks if you, you know, you plant 8,000 trees, I got 8,000 bushel and I'm like, well, now what do I do is 6,000. So we've got to have that, that plan on the other end on, on what we're looking at to put in. So I think that's a very interesting and the exciting trend because people are willing to try something different and and as an orchard you can try these new varieties and there is a ton of them coming out yep um one thing i'll tell you is uh, has anybody in here over thinned honey crisp i didn't think so there's your first <laughs> answer we always think we're hitting them too hard, and we never do. I had an old guy tell me one time he used to throw everything he could in the tank um, as hard as he could. He sprayed them, and then he went fishing for two weeks. Didn't worry about it. And, um, you know, that's, that's not a bad philosophy, but for us, we're still learning on this. But the things I've learned the last few years is hit them early and, you know, start it. you got to nibble at it. You're not going to get it down in one. If you do, you're a much braver person than I am. Uh, petal fall, yeah, we're doing, and it depends on the year. If I have a really good year where we've had great conditions, I will start petal fall. But I'm typically doing it at, at uh, about um, six, seven millimeter, and I'm because I, I can really see what's what stayed then, and I'll jump on them then and hit them, uh, and then I'll jump on them and we're measuring them. You know, I'll take a tree and I'll take a cluster of them and I'll measure them. And I've seen a lot of people do where they all, all these charts and everything and they're doing that. And if you get in, if you have a, a NUA weather station or people around you, you can get in there and go in their carbohydrate thinning model. That's great because it'll tell you whether you should increase your spray uh, uh, by 20% or decrease it and that helps you out a lot. But I know a lot of people take and measure those apples and they'll chart it all out. I take a, I take a, a little caliper, uh, electronic um, caliper, and I measure them, I take a Sharpie and I write it right on the apple. 
if it's six millimeters or eight millimeters or nine millimeters. Because then when I come back the next time I measure it, if it's still there, if it's gone, hey, good. If it's still there though, I know it was you know eight millimeters and I measured if it's 12, I know it's still growing and I know it's gonna stay. So um, it, it's just kind of a shortcut, um, you know, easier way to do it, but it, it's pretty effective. And I'll try and do that on, you know, five or six clusters on a tree and try and do, you know, 10 or so trees in, the, in that block because they will thin differently. Younger trees, older trees, um, crop load they have on them, crop load they had on them last year, um, all those type of things work. But nibble at it. And we try and a lot of times hit, hit them three times. If they're not what you want, hit them again. And the later you go, the harder it is to get them off them. Um, but you will have some cumulative effect in there too. So you got to be a little careful of, you know, keep going and, and re increasing it and increasing it because you can get that kind of slide by effect where, you know, I, I didn't knock it off with, you know, so many parts per million NAA. Now I'm going to come up a little bit. Um, you kind of have to watch that. But, you know, weather um, has a big effect in that. So you watch that. But be aggressive. Start early. Give yourself several opportunities to go at it. And absolutely, like you're seeing, get them down to ones. And then you might still have to do some. It's very, very hard to chemical thin past ones, you know, because you can get them all the ones and still have too many apples because you got to look at your spacing. You know, if you, there's some of these tools where you can do them, the trunk diameter, cross-sectional diameter, I'll tell you how many tree, how many, you know, apples uh, on that. So you, you do, all, do all that. But give yourself several opportunities to go at them. Yeah, typically. You know, if it's warmer and things are moving a little faster, I'll come in a little sooner. It's always better sooner than later, you know. Yeah. Have you looked at uh, pruning balls with circle bar uh, mechanical pruning? Yep, hedging? Yeah, yeah it's really cool. Um, we were gung-ho and thought we were going to do it. Um, I don't know whether we need to. If we're doing a really good job, um, pruning in the uh, in the in the winter and taking out what we need to now we're going from uh, diehard central leader guys over to this so we leave way too many things in the tree we got to learn to prune aggressive earlier um, but if we're doing what we do then um, I don't know if there's as much need to sickle bar prune them and if you sickle bar prune them, the thing that worries me is fire blight and the other thing that you, you're gonna go back in the winter and clean up some of those sickle cuts um, you know, if they're not in the right spot. But I think it does, I, it, on larger operations, I think it does have it does have a place. But it was a real big trend and talking point a couple years ago. Now I haven't heard quite as much. So we'll just kind of see. And that was one thing I want to say, is when I said, you know, earlier uh, presentation about removing all those branches on that, that, that tree right away, when I'm doing that, I'm coming back in immediately. So I'll prune till 3 o'clock that day, and then I'll jump in and I'll, I'll hit them with a copper spray. Because we want to make sure we're covering up those pruning those ends that we pruned off all those branches with copper. Because we don't want to get we, we took all that off that bloom off so we didn't get fire blight. But we don't want to. The only way I wouldn't do it is if they told me there's a week of dry weather coming for sure, and I probably would still do it. It's cheap. It's so easy to do. Um, you know, we had this stuff. I remember when we used to dehorn cattle. Um, you'd cut them and they'd bleed, and you put this powder on there. And I asked the vet what that does. He says it makes the farmer feel good because he put something on. That copper spray is kind of like that. You know, I mean, it, it makes me sleep better at night because I'm, I know I've got that covered up. Because what you don't want to do is plant a thousand trees per acre and then have fire blight come in. So I've seen that happen and I've seen them, you know, two years later, the block's gone. So that's one thing you got to be very vigilant on is protecting fire blight. Because the way we're growing trees now, we're pushing them hard. Lots of new growth, lots of vigor. We're setting ourselves up for a huge fire blight problem. So if you don't do anything else, the first two and three years really prevent, do everything you can to prevent fire blight. You mentioned too many Mackintosh. Is that because there's a fifth of people wanting that? Exactly right. My, uh, my father says we, we grow, um, you know, 70% of what we, we grow is Macs and Quartz, and he says uh, the people that buy Macintosh and Cortlands are dying every day. And that's, you know, it's a tough way to look at it, but it's true. You know, the trend is changing. Uh, those are more cooking apples. Um, people cook less and so um, yeah we we are able to market what we have now but it's becoming much much more difficult um, and I would get rid of our Macintosh before I would get rid of our Cortlands just because Cortlands are much easier to grow much easier to pack um, but they're much harder to sell commercially anything else um, a little bit, not a lot. We're going to start using more in this high density stuff because as we get some of these um, ones we're seeing in a few varieties, we're stretching up 
above higher than where we are, and I think we're going to have to start using it more. It's a great fire blight preventative. We had in our block where we did the grafting, and uh, the first year they grew, and they got about half where we wanted, and then this last summer they were growing. They were doing great, and I kept them covered up you know, all the way through, uh, keeping fire blight out of them, and I switched and used a couple other products in there to keep my rotation going. And then we started in, in about late August, it started creeping in a little fire blight. And there's a strike here, and there's a strike there, and I drive that. My young stuff, um, throughout the course of the summer, I go through and, and, and keep the leaders singled out, you know, so you have one leader going up. I probably walk through everything three times at least during the summer, but I drive through everything once a week looking for fire blight on everything, every new block up to about three or four years old and on our varieties that are more prone to it. And I do that, and we st it started creeping in, and so I was pruning it out, taking that stuff out, and what I should have done, that stuff had grown so well, and it was almost to where we, I should have hit it with Apogee right away and shut it right down. Because we didn't lose a lot of trees, but I probably could have kept 90% out of it. So it's another good tool on your fire blight prone varieties to help shut that down, that growth down, keep it out. One more question. Yeah, how long ago did you go to trellis from standard trees? To um, about 15 years ago, and the first ones we did were wrong. Spacing was wrong and everything, and we were just talking about, we've debated whether we should go in and put trees back in the middle, but now we're far enough out. Sometimes you got to leave a really good example of your mistakes there so you can look at it all the time and know. That's why we don't do that. So how fast did you convert? Rather than like the early 2000s, you converted? We're, yeah, we're starting to, yeah. Is that a five-year period you converted everything? No, we're still about 100 acres of semi-dwarfs. And some of it is very, very productive of semi-dwarfs. We started at first doing, um, you know, a couple acres a year. Uh, we wanted to get, uh, you know, learn what we were doing, and we started a couple different trellis types and doing things like that. And then we started to get, because, you know, before when we were planting the lower densities, you know, we were planting, you know, 2,000, 3,000 trees a year. Boy, it's really hard to convince the bookkeeper that I need to plant and order 10,000 trees for next year, and I ordered a semi-load of posts and all those things. So, you know, once we got convinced that that was the way to go, you got to kind of see things grow and see how it works. That was a way to go. We could manage and we could do, um, you know, handle the things. Now we've got more aggressive. And some of it, too, is um, years, we're more aggressive on years when we've got varieties that we know we really want to get in the ground and get production up faster. Now, if we have a, a break in there where we say, well, there's really not anything we're super excited about getting a lot in the ground right now, maybe we come down to, you know, a, a few less, you know, four or 5,000 in a year just to, you know, to put some in. you got to keep sharp, you know, make sure you remember how to plant in that. Um, but, um, you know, maybe we slow down for a few years on some of those things. But your density, density is giving you like, what, 15,000 pounds an acre or something? Um, yeah, so we look at it, we look at it at bushels to the acre. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking where we, right now, um, on, the, uh, on the older stuff, yeah, if we're, I think we're average, you know, six to seven on bushel to the acre. On the new high density stuff, we had a block of pizzazz this year that are too far apart. They're like at four feet. And um, when we picked that this year, they're four years old. There was 1,250 bushels of the acre on what I would consider 80% of a crop. So the opportunity is to get there, but our goal is typically we want to do 1,000 bushels to the acre or better going forward. We've got so many honey crisps that we know we're not going to be, you know, if we try and grow that, that much honey crisp on there, we're going to have poor stuff this year and nothing next year.